I tell you, Dan- Daniel Christmas has turned the announcement video into an event at Gateway Christian Church, has he not? <laughs> I mean, you never know what you're going to get at the end of that video. So great job, Daniel. You always make it fun. I don't know where you are, bro, but, but you always make that so much fun, brother. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work on that. So, um, you know, I've, I've talked about how we've had a lot of life events, a lot of life events in the last month and a half, two months. I mean, we've had, you know, a son graduate and then get married to a, a wonderful woman, Katie. Taven and Katie are here today. Surprise me, so I'm going to get a little weepy, I think, here in a moment. Right? We, we've had a, a, another a daughter, Danae, graduate, right, from high school. Her beau, got his uh, associates as well, graduated as well. It's pretty John Monosmith. And then we had our son, Keenan and, and Abby. They got married as well. I mean, just has been a, just a terrific month. So many life events, all in just a short period of time. You can understand that, right? I mean, this is a lot and, and good, but they can add some stress to your life. And so we decided, we decided after about a year and a half, two years or so, we decided to, to just go ahead and cap off what, what is a crazy summer, to go ahead and to sell our house and to buy a new house. Now, this is news to many of you, news not to some of you, but we, we have made a decision. Um, we're, not, we're not moving from Gateway. We're going to continue to, to minister here at Gateway as long as the Lord has us here. We're excited. But God has called our family to move into the city of Ferguson. This is the first time some of you are, are, are realizing that or have heard that. Um, started really about a couple of years after all the events in Ferguson. Um, I got together with Reagan and, and his father-in-law was, was leading a group of pastors from the area to begin to pray how God could could use the, the ministers and the churches in this area to kind of rally around the Ferguson area and to see the city transform, maybe from, you know, understanding the Ferguson effect as something negative, and then maybe the Ferguson could have an effect where there really could be God's move, revival kind of pouring out of that place. And it really began to stir in my heart this vision, this idea that I, I want to be a part of, of that. I want to incarnationally go into the, the city and be a part of, of something positive that God wants to do through a place that was, at, at one moment in St. Louis's history, very, very dark. And so I, I, I began to hear from the Lord, and I thought, how am I going to break this to my wife? And then one day we're driving up to St. Louis Christian College, uh, where Taven and Katie are admission counselors there, and we're driving up to St. Louis Christian College, and, and, and Carrie just kind of out of the blue, she says, honey, I just want to tell you that the Lord's been working on my heart and I think we, we're gonna, we, need, we need to think about praying, moving to Ferguson. And I was like, me too. <laughs> Thank you, God. You made that easy for me, right? How was I going to break this to my wife? And, and so we talked to our kids, prayed with our kids over the last year and a half, and there were some ups and downs about the idea of emotionally leaving the home that for, for our children, they, they just have grown up in. I mean, some of you know what I'm talking about. And so we, we are, we're... We've been working on our home, and our house goes on the market on Wednesday. Whew. That's crazy. We've had, like, you know, a realtor and stages come in and say, man, you just need to change everything, dude, right? So those kind of, those kind of like, <laughs> moments. And uh, that's been really exciting. And then we've also got a contingent contract on a home in, in, in Ferguson, right down the street from Ferguson Christian Church on the same road, Royal, as a matter of fact. And we're really, we're really excited about, about, about the move we're not so excited about moving. Anybody with me? Right? If, 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 uh, if it was just about the move, it would be okay. But the moving part always kind of gets in the way. And if you've, ever, if you've ever moved, you know what I'm talking about. Right? You begin to rediscover what Larry Burkett, he's this financial advisor that's gone on to be with the Lord. He calls it the law of expanding possessions. <laughs> right? Some of you st- students, you don't realize it exists, but it exists in your room right now. But it's existed with parents in their homes for, for, for many years before that. The law of expanding possessions, which is this concept or idea that our stuff has this magical power to multiply when we're not looking. Right? It, it just multiplies. And, and when you begin to move, all of a sudden you begin to notice those things that have multiplied because you find yourself either making a decision to pack or throw away these things and you're looking at it and carrying out like, a, where did that even come from? You know what I mean? Like, what is this? And then maybe, you, you know, maybe one spouse is looking at the other and saying, you know, why, why, do you even, why are we even holding on to this? And you have to make a decision. For me, I realized that, that putting our house on the market on Wednesday, Wednesday has become a day of reckoning for my garage. <laughs> and I've talked about this, all the projects. I mean, I'm a project guy. I like to, I like to find broken things and fix broken things and restore them. 
And I realize it's a day of reckoning where I have to make a decision to purge what's in my garage, the things that are important to me that I, I want to see fixed. And I've learned a very valuable spiritual lesson in this, in this process, this short process of making decision to move. I've learned that if you're unwilling to get rid of stuff, stuff will pile up. If you're unwilling to get rid of stuff, and then you can define stuff as whatever you want, stuff will begin to pile up. And that's true for a garage. That's true for a home. That's true for a church. And that's true for every one of our hearts. If we're unwilling to get rid of the stuff that resides in there, then sooner or later there'll be a day of reckoning we'll have to deal with everything that has piled up. In this fourth letter to the church in, in, in Revelation, Jesus is about to lay down some of his strongest, strongest language as he's speaking of this day of reckoning, the impending judgment that is coming to this church if they do not begin to clean up their act and deal with all of the things that are beginning to compile in, in their midst. And remember, we've, we've seen that Jesus has already given and you know, kind of doled out some very, very tough talk to the churches. We, we've seen him. There have been many come to Jesus moments, but, but here in this text, we see that he's about to ratchet it up a notch as he's speaking to the fourth church and the seven of these churches as we're going through this kind of bend, this U-turn in, in Asia Minor. Now, as he, as he talks, we know that's not all tough talk, that Jesus does offer some encouragement. He uses what some of you, if you counsel or manage people, he uses what, you know, what we call the sandwich method. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you got something positive, negative, positive, praise, critique, praise. And he does that. I mean, he starts off with really something positive, and he does a really nice introduction, and then he talks about how things are going well. These are all the things that I really appreciate about you, that you are doing well. And then he gets to the meat of it. He gets to the meat of his critique and says, but I have these things against you. These are the things that are not going so well. And then Jesus follows it up with some more positive praise, really really some next steps they can take to be productive, and then he wraps it up with, with a promise. So it is, it's like positive, negative, positive. Now, I realize I'm looking, I've lost you. You guys are looking at the sandwich right now. <laughs> right? How many of you are thinking about Chick-fil-A right now? Hey, you're welcome because it's Sunday, yeah. <laughs> and you ain't getting no chicken sandwich. All right? I did that on purpose. I thought it'd be funny. That's how my mind works. So, so, you know, so as you're looking at that picture and as you're hungering and thirsting for righteous chicken, I want you to, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. This fourth letter picks up with verse 18. Revelation 2, 18, it reads as follows. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Man, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good stuff in here. Let's stop there, those first two verses. It's, it's fascinating that, that Thyatira would be a target for a letter because Thyatira, out of all of these seven churches, Thyatira is the smallest of these cities. It really, it was kind of a town. It had about 30,000 people, roughly the size of Baldwin in our area, according to the last census. About 30,000 people there. And really, there wasn't anything notable about this town. It was the kind of town that, that people would just kind of travel past. It was, it was known to be a blue-collar town. I mean, not a lot of temples, not a lot of anything. A blue-collar town that really had a, had a great blue-collar group of people that were working industries like metalworking, clothing and, and textile trades. Along with those textile and, and metal trades, there were these guilds. Now, guilds are kind of the equivalent, modern-day equivalent of our, of our unions, but, but guilds had a specific thing about them where they, they actually had these, these, these designated deities that went with these guilds. Think of it like a spiritual or an idol mascot is what they had. And along with these idolatrous mascots was each one of these metalworking guild, the clothing guild. With each one of them, they would have these festivals and feasts. And along with these feasts and festivals, there's a lot of revelry. There was sexual immorality. There were a lot of things that, that displeased the Lord. But, but on a whole, there wasn't anything spectacular about a Thyatira. We've heard of Thyatira before. If you've done a, an Acts study, you know that in Acts chapter 14, the Apostle Paul, he's traveling through Asia Minor, 
and he meets this woman. Her name is Lydia. And Lydia, of all things, she's a seller of purple cloth. She's a part of this textile industry that is out of Thyatira. And, and we get this really positive impression of Thyatira through Lydia because Lydia gives her life over to Christ with the message of Christ that Paul is preaching. And as a result, we find that she begins to support financially the mission of God through the Apostle Paul. It's, it's pretty incredible. But outside of the scripture, outside of Acts chapter 14, um, the world at large did not look at Thyatira as anything positive or special. As a matter of fact, it just was very forgetful. There's a church historian, his name is Pliny, and Pliny described really bluntly Thyatira as an unimportant and insignificant community. Can you imagine? Welcome to Thyatira. We're an unimportant and insignificant community. I mean, you're probably not going to see that byline too many on those welcome signs when you're coming in to a town, but that's, that's how they were viewed. There was nothing special. It wasn't anything attractive. Nobody was traveling there. It was, by all accounts, a small, insignificant place, but not to the Lord. Amen? Not to the Lord. Among all these metropolitan cities, God had picked out, God had picked out Thyatira to speak a word into their into their lives. And if you, think, if you know anything about Jesus, you, you know that he had a deep love for those who were small in stature. Think of Zacchaeus. That he had affinity for those who were, who were down and out. Think of the lepers and those people that were caught in, in, in acts of adultery. Those people, he had an affinity for those people who were forgotten and ins, insignificant. He, he loved them. And, and for Christ... The people of Thyatira, their spiritual maturity mattered to him. And I want to say this this morning. No matter where you are, where you come from, where you've been, as insignificant, as unimportant as you may feel, God sees you, God knows you, and, and your spiritual maturity matters to him as well. Amen? That's the beauty of this passage. It's small, but man, there's, there's some things that God wants to hash out in this church. In fact, the, the smallest town receives the longest letter. I think that's kind of cool. The smallest town. And some of it is because he's profusive with his praise. But there's other portions of this that he's really, he's really communicating some things that really need to be dealt with on a bigger scale. They may be small. Sometimes we think, if I can just get to a small town, right, where everything is kind of white picket perfect. If I could just get there, everything would be great. Or if I could just get to a smaller church, right, where everybody knows everybody and everybody's in everybody's business. If I could just get there, then, then everything would be terrific. And the truth is, smaller isn't always better, and smaller certainly isn't perfect. With, with Thyatira specifically, they may be small, but they are dealing with some huge problems as a church. And so Jesus comes in this introduction to the church of Thyatira. Jesus comes and he introduces himself in a manner that I will say, out of all the seven letters, it is one of the most authoritative and confrontational ways that he introduces himself. He introduces himself as the son of God. We well, say, well, we've, we've heard Jesus describe himself as a son before. You think of the gospels. Many times in the gospels, he descri describes himself as a son of man, which really is highlighting his deity, or his, his humanity rather. But here he's highlighting his, his deity. And it's, it's notable because out of all the names, and there are many in the book of Revelations, out of all the names, this is the only time that he introduces himself or describes himself as the son of God in the whole book of Revelation. It's notable, noticeable. And so not only is the son of God, but the son of God with, with eyes like blazing fire and with feet like burnished bronze. These are, these are two metaphors that really begin to help you understand who the son of God is. That he's one that's coming this time. He's one that's coming with this impending day of, of reckoning for a church that needs to clean up their act. It, it's, it's important to, to notice also as he's talking about this, he's eyes of blazing fire, that, that he says he knows. I, I, I talked about that the first week that I preached. I think it was the second passage where he says, I know. He says this over and over and over. And I think that the phrase that jumps out to me probably in all of these letters is the fact that he, that he, does, he does know. I was speaking with a, with a new friend of mine um, that I met a couple of weeks ago after that sermon, and we were talking about this phrase, I know, and, and really talking about how in that sermon to, to Smyrna, I kind of deviated and, and talked about how Christ knows your situation, that we, we think we're hiding it from everybody else, but Christ knows your situation. And, and just for a moment, I broke and I, and I talked about the epidemic of suicide that's happening in the American culture, that it's 
that it's one of the top 10 causes of death in the American culture right now. And I was just shocked by that statistic and all the high profile and, and really the people that, that, have, that have lost their life to suicide that have impacted, that impacted my, my sphere as well and maybe yours. And so I just shared that and I didn't, it wasn't in my notes. I didn't necessarily know why other than the Holy Spirit kind of prompted me to do that. And, and afterwards, and I asked this gentleman if I could share this, afterwards, he came to me, he says, I really need to talk, and we talked, and so we talked, and we prayed, and I said, hey, would you be willing to go to lunch with me later on this week? And we went to lunch, sit down at Culver's, and we're having lunch, and um, he said, I just wanted to share with you that, um, you said you don't know why you were sharing this, because I want to tell you that, that I came to church about a year ago, a year ago, and he goes, I've been dealing with alcohol and drugs all my life. Came to church about a year ago, and he goes, and I just fell back into it. And he goes, and, I'm, and I realize I'm ruining my life. And he goes, I come to the point, he goes, I came that Sunday with this thought in mind. God, if something doesn't happen this Sunday, because I was putting it all in line, if something doesn't happen, I'm going to drink and drug myself to death in the next month. Because I'm just going to step off the cliff. He goes, and when you started talking about that, he goes, I realize that God does hear me, that God does know me, that God does care about me. And praise God, he was here this morning, sober, ready to keep walking with Jesus, amen? I mean, I was pretty, I was pretty jazzed about that. But it just reminds me of the power of God that he does. He, he knows, he sees things. He's got these eyes like blazing fire. I mean, we think that we can... We can, we can hide it and cover it, but his eyes penetrate, and penetrate through all of, that, all of that stuff that we try to hide behind, and he sees right into our innermost motives and thoughts and attitudes. He sees it. And he says that he's also this, this one who comes with feet that are burnished bronze. Now, what does that mean? It would have certainly connected with the metal workers. They would have had an understanding of this burnished bronze. They would have understood that these are feet that are forged and purified, that they're firm, they're solid, they're secure, and they have the ability to hold you in place secure and to move you forward. They're, they're powerful. They're powerful. So these two, these two images, from the blazing eyes to the burnished bronze feet, they really are communicating how he wants to move the church forward. There's, there's this day of reckoning for, for the church to clean up their act. Then after Jesus introduces himself, at first glance, it, it looks like he doesn't have much kind of much kind of uh, judgment to dole out. He begins going through the list of things that they're doing well. Hey, I love your, your love and your, your service, your, your faith. I love the way that you kind of persevere, even, even when it seems like it's... Trevor the piano guy is his name. Yeah, was that hot? Wait till you hear the story. It's really hot. It's pretty good. All right. Trevor the piano guy. And Trevor the piano guy called me up. He said, hey, you know, um, I move pianos. I collect pianos. As a matter of fact, this piano, where he collects them, this would be number 72 for him in his collection. Yeah, he, he told me, he goes, he goes, it's kind of turned into kind of an addiction for me. I, I was like, that, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. What the heck do you do? I asked, do you play? He goes, not yet. I'm like... How many do you have to collect before you start, pal? I mean, come on. Right? So it was just kind of crazy. But he's asking me about this piano. He goes, so where's it located? I said, it's in the basement. We have a walkout basement. You know, it's easy to get to. He goes, is there, is there, a, is there a hill to the basement? I go, yeah, it's just a, a, you know, a slight slope. I said, but my boys and I, we were able to get the piano into the, into the house. And there he goes, okay. He goes, can I pull my truck up to the back of your house? I go, no. <laughs> 
and it's not possible to get in between the houses or whatever. He goes, so the, this hill, he goes, how steep is it? I said, hey, it's just a, just a slope. I go, like I said, I, I was able to get the piano down into the basement with my three sons who were teenagers at, at the time. He goes, he goes, yeah, he goes, yeah. He goes, but you know, moving a piano uphill is a lot different than moving a piano downhill. I was like, hey, you got me on that one, Trevor. I'll give you, I'll give you that. Right, moving it uphill and doing really anything uphill is a lot harder than it is going downhill. And, and Christ is, is looking at the church of Thyatira and he has this expectation for them to move forward in their faith, not to stay static. Because if they stay static, if they stay static, they're probably going to begin to retreat. As, as we were as helping him with these other two guys, three guys, we're pushing this piano uphill. It was more difficult, by the way. As we're pushing it uphill, I realized that when you're pushing an upright piano uphill, you really don't have any time to relax. You can't just take a break and say, hold on a second. I'll be right there. You know, you can't, you can't do that because you'll become a speed bump for the piano. So you have to keep, you have to keep momentum moving forward. And, and, and God has this expectation to the church in Thyatira. You're doing all of these things great. I've listed out four, but listen, I want you to be moving forward, to think about moving forward in your faith. He has this expectation for all of us. He's concerned and keyed into our spiritual maturity, but he also, he also wants to see us moving forward, even though we may be doing things very well. And so we got this great resume for a church. It's one of the only seven churches that's commended for, for its love. It's a really happening church. If you are a first-time guest, I mean, this kind of church would be like, man, I'm going to be back next Sunday. This is, a, this is a great happening place to be. And so you think, well, what could possibly be Jesus' critique with Thyatira? Well, verses 20 through 23 tells us, it says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent for her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways, repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, and then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds, and I will repay everyone according to your deeds. That's some pretty sobering language, isn't it, in there? That's what I mean. This is some of the, some of the strongest expression of, of reckoning and judgment that Jesus gives in, in all of the letters. And you think, well, what's going, what's going on here? He's saying, listen, you, you have been doing a lot of things well, but there is an element. The church is kind of moving in two directions. There are some that are, that are doing well, but there's others that are beginning to follow this presence, this, this woman who claims to be a prophet of God. Her name is Jezebel. Now, now listen, most scholars believe that Jezebel wasn't her real name, that Jezebel was like her spiritual nickname. We, we find that Jesus likes to give nicknames to people all the time. This wasn't a good one, right? As a matter of fact, we, we don't think too highly of the, of the name Jezebel at all. There's a real negative association it harkens back to, to an Old Testament character. Really, this, this wasn't a strong, strong name. Um, if, if your name is Jezebel and you're here for the first time, I, I just want to apologize. I apologize to you and your husband, Ahab, apparently, because, <laughs> because those are the two characters. They were married, you know, king and queen of, of Israel. And uh, they, they have been, through history, kind of known as a corrupt couple. As a matter of fact, you, you'll find neither name trending on babynames.com. It won't be there. Neither one. Let, let me tell you just a little bit about the backstory of, of Jezebel and Ahab. Um, Jezebel and Ahab, if you go back to the time of kings, especially to the time of Elijah, you'll find that Jezebel was a kind of queen that would ask for something, and her husband Ahab was completely spineless. She would say, I, I want to set up, I want to set up Asherah poles and, and idol worship to, to Baal. And he said, yes, dear. I want to just slay all the prophets of Yahweh, all the, all the, all the people that speak on behalf of Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. I want to slay them. And she would say, he said, yes, dear. And it wasn't until a time where, where there was this prophet named Elijah that stood up to these false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. You remember this, 1 Kings chapter 18. And he calls down fire from heaven to consume this offering that had been laid out. And after the offering is consumed by, by the Lord God of Israel, the people begin to chant, wow, our God is the Lord God of, of, of all. And you would think that Jezebel would repent of her ways, but she didn't. As a matter of fact, if you move over to 
chapter 19 in 1 Kings, it says that, that she, she said, may the Lord deal with me, maybe the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow, Elijah doesn't lie dead like the rest of these other prophets of mine. She wasn't, she wasn't repentant at all. As a matter of fact, she wanted to ratchet up her angst and her, her murder of the prophets of God. And so like Queen Jezebel, the Lord is saying that the church of Thyatira has somebody in their midst that is doing the same thing, that is seducing people and leading them astray to participate in, in sexual immorality and idol worship. God is confronting what is holding them back. They may not be aware of it, but God is confronting what is holding them back as believers in, in Christ. And, and not just se- any sexual immorality. He, he uses the word people that have committed adultery with her. There's, there's idolatry and adultery. You see both of those elements in this passage, and, and they're more connected than you might think. God hates both of these for, for really the same reason. Adultery is, is a microcosm of idolatry. Think of it this way. Adultery happens when there are two people who have made a commitment and a covenant to one another before God to be faithful and pure and to only hold out for each other. That's what you did when, when, when you got married, when I got married. Someday when you get married, you're making a covenant before God to be pure and holy, to commit to one another and to one another alone. Adultery violates that. When you cheat on the other person, on a larger macro level, idolatry is the same thing. It's a God who has a covenant of love, a covenant of blood that he has made through Christ Jesus with his people. And we wreck and violate that covenant in idolatry when we choose to cheat on him by worshiping other idols. Our idols don't look like Asherah poles or, or bulls that are made out of brass or, or stone or, or gold. Our idols look like our jobs, our workplaces, our careers, our student activities, a lot of other things. Our idols look a lot different than they look in the Old Testament, but, but they function the same way. They divorce our affection for the God who has made a covenant with us by his blood. Adultery and idolatry, they're they're one and the same, and they both break the heart of God. And and Jezebel is encouraging, inciting, and promoting both in the life of the church of Thyatira. And God says, this is why I'm going to come against them. God is confronting them with the things that are holding them back. I, I wonder sometimes, when God uses people, sometimes a song, maybe a scripture, to confront us about the sin that's in our lives that needs to be confronted, how, how do we respond? I don't always respond in the appropriate way. But how, do we, how do we respond? Do we, do we just deny it? Do we try to transfer it, blame shift it onto somebody else? Do we try to rationalize it in some way? Or do we repent of it, realizing that, that that sin continues to pile up in our life? There's going to be a day of reckoning where we're going to have to deal with the mess that we have made in our lives. I, I had the blessing as we're painting and patching up our walls and doing different things, there's a couple from outside of Gateway that called us up and said, hey, can, can we come over and talk? We just need to talk through some things in our life. And, and Carrie and I said, yeah, sure. We're, we're, the house is a mess. And so we had the blessing to sit down and, and we were here going to counsel, going to listen and counsel to them. And as they, as they shared, they said, one of the issues, you know, just recently, you know, my husband, he's, he's working and he's just kind of piling all these things. And what I notice is he comes home, all these frustration and this anger, all of these things that are happening to him, he comes home and he just kind of transfers them onto me. Right? He, he's feeling all this pressure. He's feeling all this, this frustration. And then he comes home and even though I know he loves me, he just, he just begins to lay into me. And she goes, finally, I just stood up and I said, hey, you deserve that. <laughs> and it was, it was a moment where he was confronted with what he was doing. Now, as they were sharing that, and this happens often, maybe I'm just the only one, as they were sharing that, the, the Lord began to convict me. That ever happened to you? Somebody's being confessional in front of you, and you're like, oh, man, I'm doing that too, <laughs> right? The Lord began to convict me like, oh, man, what you're saying is, is where, where I know that I've been, that sometimes I come home, and I've got this frustration, and, and what happens is, is, is instead of giving my, my children my best, instead of giving my wife my best, I give them the very worst of who I am because I just think I just want to get this transferred off of me and onto somebody else. And I don't want to deal with my own sin and be confronted with it. And, and in that moment, I found like, you know, as I was trying to counsel them, I thought, can I just share with you? I need to be counseled too, right? That's, that's the way the Lord works. What do we do 
when we're confronted with our own sin? Do we deny it or do we, do we recognize it and say, it is time to, to remove this from our life? If we don't purge it, that stuff will continue to pile up and we will have to deal with the mess that's caused in our lives. When, when the Lord doles out this judgment, he says, listen, I gave Jezebel time to repent, but she wasn't willing to be confronted by it and willing to receive it and willing to turn from it. I gave her, I gave her time. And the Lord, he does that. He is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, First Peter tells us. He wants her to turn, but she, she's not willing to do it. And oftentimes we're the same way. And he says, because she's not willing to repent, listen, I'm, I'm going to do a very harsh punishment. She's leading people to the bed. She'll be cast onto a bed of sufferings. And all of those people who follow her, all of the people who are her children in practice, they're going to follow the same, same type of punishment and suffering. And, and it's heavy language to be saying, if they're not willing to turn, I'm going to turn them over to their own devices and allow them to experience the pain, the pain of all the stuff that's piling up on their shoulders. It doesn't have to be that way. God calls us as his people to recognize and really to invite him to come and search our hearts. It reminds me of this passage in Psalm Psalm 139. Would you read this with me? It's a great prayer. Would you read it with me? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen? Just look at those words for a moment. And let God guide him to the place that, that you need to hear him. What if you woke up in the morning? What if we woke up in the morning and the first prayer on our lips of God, search me. Search me and know my heart. Try me, God. Put me through the trial and, and reveal, bring to the surface my, my anxious thoughts. God, I, I want you to help me see if there's any wrong way, any grievous way in me. And then, God, I want you to lead me in the way everlasting. There's a lot of repentance in there before moving forward. You see that? searching and knowing and trying before the leading happens. And listen, we, we want God to move us forward, we, we, but he actually needs to begin to reveal to us the things that are holding, holding us back. Sometimes when, when, when the Lord reveals that stuff to me, um, I can be discouraged and I think, God, I, don't, I, I, hate, I, I, hate, I hate what I see. I hate what I see in me, God. I hate the way I sound. Um, I hate my actions. And God says, God, I, I want you to hate it because I want it out of you. It doesn't belong in you. That's why I'm showing it to you. And, and that's God's desire. We hate it, but he, he hates it even more. And he gave his son in order that it could be expunged from our lives. And, and we have to deal with it. Otherwise, the day of reckoning is coming. And we'll have to deal with it then. At the very end, the Lord closes with this praise again, these positive thoughts. He says, now I say to the rest of you at Thyatira. Now, again, this is just because there's a split here. There, there, there's one group that's following Jezebel, but apparently there's a group that's not. He says, I say to those, the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That, will, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I, I receive authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says. A lot of imagery there, but the idea is this, that there are people, thankfully, within the church, in, like Gateway, that are walking well with the Lord, that you are repentant, that you are turning your life over on a daily basis and receiving all the blessings that God has for me. And to you, Christ says, keep doing it. Keep holding steadfast the very thing that has, has brought you life. Keep, keep moving in that direction. Keep pressing forward. Keep doing that. He goes, but there, there are others that, that are not, and, and he's already spoke to them. He says, but if you're, if you're moving forward, then I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that, that you have something special coming towards you. You'll, you'll rule with a scepter. Well, what's that mean, to rule with a scepter? Pretty much Jesus is saying, listen, someday, someday when he returns, it will be complete rule. We, we will all see it. Christ will win. 
Everything, everything will be changed. He's saying, if you stick with me, then, then, then listen, um, I'll stick with you. And you'll rule with me. Now, the word rule there could also be translated shepherd. You'll shepherd with me over all, all this new kingdom, this new heaven, and this new earth. So stick with me, and I'll, I'll stick with you. He says, but you'll also receive, that one will also receive the, the bright morning star. He says, I'm going to give you something infinitely better than all of the broken stuff that you've been trying to hold on to. I'm going to give you the bright morning star. And you think, well, what, what is a bright morning star? We don't have to guess. Um, the, the Bible tells us at, at the very end of Revelation, it's kind of like your textbook, at the back of the book are all the answers. It's right there. And here's what it says in Revelation chapter 22. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you that the things in the churches, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. He tells us, Jesus, and Jesus is saying, listen, I'm, I am your all-sufficient, I'm the all-sufficient thing that you need. Not all the things that you're holding on to and carrying and, and burdening your life with, but I am the all-sufficient thing that you need if you're willing to come to me and you'll receive the bright morning star. You'll be victorious that way. Clean, cleaning out my garage is, is tough because, because I collect things, broken things, and because I realize that I don't do anything. Like 72 pianos later, I don't do anything with those pianos. Listen, these items may look familiar to you. I've used these as an illustration of, of how I, I like to fix broken things. I, I've used these before. About a year and a half, two years ago, I brought them out and said, you know, I like to restore things. That's my heart and all of that. And yet, a year and a half, two years later, here they are. Still dirty, still dusty, still in disrepair. But I hang on to them. I hang on to them maybe because I think I'm going to need them. I mean, I, I look at this chair and, and, you know, I have to replace the spindle, the arm here, the seat's loose. But I think to myself, Lord willing, at some point in time, the Lord's going to provide grandchildren for me. <laughs> right? So I got to hang on to it. Or this here, I mean, this, I made this when I was a freshman in high school. It didn't look like this when I made it. I wanted to just be clear about that, right? But it's seen a lot of wear and tear, and the house has fallen a few times, and, and I keep thinking to myself, I'm, I'm going to repair this. I mean, I'm, I'm going to repair this. And yet I've, I've had this, I've had this for years. Having picked it up to touch it, just pile it up in that place of storage where I don't let anybody into, <laughs> where friends or family members come over, I don't let them into the garage because I don't want them to see all the stuff that I have piled in there. So it just remains. But when, when the day of reckoning comes, you realize you, you have to deal with all the stuff that's been piling up in there for years. I mean, you, you got you to make a decision that either I'm going to release it, that I'm going to let it go, or I'm going to actually see it restored. You've got to make a decision. And God comes to us just like he came to the church in Thyatira, and he's saying, you just got to make a decision. You're moving away from me. You're a wayward church, but you have to make a decision. Are you going to allow these things to continue to hold you back and pull you away, or are you going to release them, or are you going to allow me to restore who you are? Because if, in either case, in either way, he will give you something infinitely better, infinitely better than you can imagine that you're holding on to right now. This morning, this morning, there may be individuals here that your garage is pristine, but your hearts and your minds are cluttered. Just cluttered. Stuff has been piling on for years and years and years and years, and you're, you're thinking to myself, yeah, I'll get to it at some point. But perhaps for you today, today is that day of reckoning where God is speaking into your life and saying, something needs to change. You need to release this to me and perhaps allow me to restore it. And I, I promise you, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll give it back. If it needs to come back to you, I'll give it back to you in a way that is more beautiful than you could ever imagine. But you've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. S some of you need to re-up, rededicate your life to Christ. Some of you need to just give your life to Christ and, and fully surrender all that stuff to him. 
I'd love to talk to you here this morning, to meet you right up front and to pray with you and to help you begin your step of just releasing and surrendering all that stuff to Jesus, knowing that, that he knows exactly where to go with it. He knows exactly what to do with it. There are some of you who are believers in Christ and, and we have a time of communion where you get a moment to hold fast to what he's given you. I want to say this, before you take those elements, sit down in your seat and just pray that prayer out of Psalm 139, Lord, search me. Search me. Try me. And then, Lord, lead me. Would you do that this morning? As you sit down and take communion, as you remember what Christ did in order that we might be free, released, and restored. Would you stand to your feet? Father, we are, we are not a perfect church like Ephesus, like Smyrna, like Pergamum, like Thyatira. We're not perfect at all. As a matter of fact, we look a lot like them. Each one of these seven churches, we can, we can see our own reflection. And Lord, today we come and we say that perhaps we have gone wayward. Perhaps we have gotten lost. Perhaps we have piled so much stuff into our lives that, Lord, we, we are no longer moving forward. We're sliding backwards. I pray, Father, this morning that, that people would be confronted with their own brokenness, with their own stuff, their own junk in their lives, and, and they would be willing to surrender it to you, Father. This morning, they'd be willing to surrender it to you on this day of reckoning. Lord, bless us as, as many go and partake in communion. Father, speak to them through your spirit and through these elements. But, Lord, for those who don't know you, or need to work things out with you, I pray, Father, they would come forward and just begin to allow you to deal with, with their sin and their life, with their frustrations, with their hurts, with their pains, whatever it is that's been piling up, that they would allow it to be, be confronted with it and to, to lay it before you. In Christ's name we pray, and all God's people said,